and hello to everyone out on the on the western slope. I, I actually have memories of the western slope. I had quite an adventure out there. It was funny. Um, goes all the way back to when I was a you know, wet behind the ears, you know, greenhorn, newly graduated theology student, eager to go from where I was in Pasadena back to the East Coast, and and uh, so so eager, in fact, that uh, five o'clock in the morning after the graduation. I and an, another graduate hopped into my trusty old 1974 Renault R12, this exotic French station wagon, and took off for the east. So I see that first morning, we left at five, we made it up to Las Vegas for lunch, down through Zion National Park, into the Grand Canyon, where we took out part of the muffler on the logging roads, uh, slept over for the night. I think the next day we drove up through Canyon lands, it's a beautiful sight, and then crossed the border into Colorado when it was late at night and it was raining hard and there were some rock slides. So we pulled off into uh, a rest area on I-70, just over the border into Colorado and slept there for the night. <clears throat> and we got up in the morning and instead of rain, and here is in May, there was six inches of snow in the car. So we, um, you know, we cleared off the snow, we went into the rest area, we washed up and came back out and there was another six inches of snow on the car. Uh, you guys have some really weird weather out there. <laughs> so that kind of changed our plan. So here we have we have the, the, the snow chains on the car and we're going across the Rockies and we lose the starter. So here are these, these two kids push starting this manual transmission old French station wagon across the Rockies on chains in the snow. Uh, finally get that fixed in Denver. We keep going. We I think we lost the idler pulley in Pueblo. We lost the battery and the speedometer cable in Oklahoma. And, uh, <laughs> and we finally pulled across the border, limped across the border into Fort Smith, Arkansas. And when I got there, pulled into a gas station and it was clearly a very born again gas station. All these young men who were just bubbly and smiling, happy and bouncing all over the place. And you know, they come up to the car and you know, at the time again, I, I just graduated. And when I was in school, I always kept a, you know, a, this little tiny Bible in my pocket. Probably can't even read it nowadays, but I did I did have this in my pocket. And he was so happy to see this fellow who had pulled into gas up with a bite with a Bible in his pocket. And so he bounced over to me with this beaming, beaming smile and he says, Brother, are you saved? And I, being a very arrogant and stupid and sinful theology major said, save from what? <laughs> he said, you know, are you saved? I said, yes, save from what? And his face kind of fell and he said, no, oh, you know, saved. And, you know, that was wrong. I was stupid. I was sinful. I was prideful. But I guess what I was trying, the point I was trying to make in my stupidity and my sinful pride was that he hadn't a clue of what he was talking about, hadn't any idea what salvation was. And we do that often in the church. We use these words, we use salvation, we use redeemer, we use savior, we use grace, we use Hosanna, we use Alleluia. We really don't know what they mean. And so that's my goal today, at least this morning, is that to look at these terms, to connect the dots, to talk about just what is the plan? What is salvation? What does it mean? What in the world, literally, is God doing? You know, it's, it's hard to understand the Bible. It's hard to embrace the Bible and the mass and the liturgy and the sacraments if we don't really know what the plan is. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does anyway, but it's a whole lot better if we work with it. So what is the plan? What is God doing? Well, let's take a look. Let's start with St. Paul and how he described what this plan and what this message was. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here, share a Bible. And let's take a look at what the scriptures tell us. So here is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And Paul writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, hold on to that thought. We're gonna come back to that a lot. That old has passed away, new has come. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their trespasses against him. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And hold on to that thought, too. We're going to come back to that one so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So let's pull this apart a little bit. So here we have the message of salvation is this message of reconciliation. We've got a bit of a problem. How do you reconcile a mosquito with a human? <laughs> How do you reconcile a mosquito with a human? Uh, the human looks at the uh, mosquito and says, ah, pest, got to kill it. And the mosquito looks at the human and says, ah, lunch. <laughs> so how do you reconcile a mosquito and a human? You know, are we any closer to God than a mosquito is to us? How do we do that? Literally, the only way is for the mosquito to become like a human, to be able to have a relationship at a human level, to be able to reconcile with the mosquito. And so it is with God. We must become something new, something beyond our humanity. We must become nothing short of divine. That's what the plan is. We must become nothing short of divine. We must transform our human nature into the very nature of God. Now, that may sound you know, blasphemous. That may say, sound like madness, but it's entirely scriptural. Again, let's return to our scriptures. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. If we go there, we see St. Peter tell us this quite literally. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. And this isn't just St. Peter. Look all over the scriptures we find this. Let's go to John. First John 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And look at this. Again, back to St. Paul. Romans 5. that through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of what? The glory of God. This is what we're called to. This is the plan. This is how we are reconciled. It's the only way we can be reconciled. We must have a God relationship with God. Not a human relationship, a God relationship with God. This is how we are reconciled. This is the friendship that we'll read about in our gospel readings. Right? If we go back over to John, we'll go to John 15 and verses 9 through 15. Let's make sure I click on the right button to share the right screen. Um, but let's go over to, to John 15. Notice he says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Now note that. It's easy to gloss over that. How has Jesus loved us? As the Father has loved him with the very love that the Trinity has had within the Trinity for all eternity. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. What love? The love of the Trinity. Let's continue on. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So with what kind of love are we supposed to love? The love of the Trinity. Look at verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves. So something has changed. Something has fundamentally changed with Christianity. Something has changed from the old covenant, from the nation of Israel. Something has changed in the way we relate to God. We no longer relate to him as humans. We are unable to relate to him as God, to have a God relationship with him. 
You are my friends. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what his master is doing. He can't think like his master, right? But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So this is utterly astounding. This is what our salvation is all about. Let's go over to John again, a little further, further down. Let's go to John 17. And in John 17, 22, Jesus says he's praying to the Father, right? This is just before he is betrayed. This is the, the high priestly discourse. The, the glory which you have given me, I have given them. What glory? The glory of God. You have given me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. How does the Father love us? The same way he loves Jesus, with the love that has been within the Trinity for forever. And no, this continues on. Look at verse 26. I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me. What love is that? The love that has been within the Trinity, the perfect selfless love of God, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So we are to have in us the very love of God, the love of the Trinity. This is, this is utterly critical to understanding our salvation. The fullness of reconciliation is when we love God as he loves us, that we love with God's entirely selfless love. Now, that becomes this challenge. This is reconciling the mosquito and the human. Bridging the gap between God and man is the plan of salvation. If we try to approach God with our human love, with our human goodness, we'll fail. We will fail. We will not be saved. When he says, brother, are you saved? Not if we try to relate to God as a human. We must bridge that gap between humanity and divinity. Salvation is so much more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness is critical. Right? But it's more than forgiveness. Our justification, another big word, right? Our being made right or being made righteous is both our redemption and our sanctification. All right, big words. We've got to define them. All right, so re redemption. What, what is the Redeemer? When we, when we praise our Redeemer, what is it? I'm going to not go through the scriptures to save some time. There's more here than I can go over today. But we find two cases of redemption in the Old Testament. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt, it was the death of the firstborn. Every th firstborn died, man and beast. And so in Israel, they remembered that by the firstborn of everything was sacrificed. Your firstborn ox, you sacrifice it to God. Firstborn sheep, you sacrifice it to God. Firstborn son or child, now what do you do? We don't do child sacrifice. So what do you do? You take another animal and you redeem the firstborn child. The redeemer is the one who dies in your place. There is also a financial aspect to it. In Israel, if you grew poor and you sold yourself into slavery to a foreigner, there was the right of redemption. So a relative could come and pay the debt that you couldn't pay. And he was your redeemer. So our redeemer is the one who pays the debt that we cannot possibly pay. But redemption is only half the story. Our forgiveness of our sins only takes care of what happened in the past. We've got to take care of why did we sin in the first place? How do we go forward into the future? How do we go forward into eternity? How do we go forward into the life of heaven? That's sanctification. And if we don't understand sanctification, we can fall into either of two ditches. The first is kind of the early reformers where they said, you know, we're hopelessly corrupt. We will never be righteous. Our sins are only covered by the blood of Christ and we have no good whatsoever. And that was wrong. The church condemned that position. Right? Don't we pray, you know, pray for us, the Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. 
But the second ditch, if we don't understand the need for sanctification, is the one that's more prevalent today, where we think we're fine, we're good enough. You know, we're fed on self-esteem, where we don't want anyone to feel guilty or ashamed about anything. In reality, we're, we're miserable. <laughs> St. Faustina, this great saint, would always talk about her misery. But that's where we start. We have to recognize how far we fall short. That it's not just our over evil. It's not just our adulteries and our thefts and our murders and our war and our crime and our gossip. That frankly, even our good and our love are often sinful. We must love with the love of God, not the love of man. What's the difference? Understanding that difference is essential to understanding what salvation is about. It is essential to understand that Christianity isn't about being a nice person, whoever you think that is, and go to church on Sunday. Christianity is a miraculous transformation by the power of grace, a radical change in the very way we think and feel and act and are. That's what salvation is, and that's what we need to come to understand. So let me take you on a, a lightning fast view of, of what has been a 40 year journey of understanding this. Again, going back, I was a first year theology major and I could just sense that something, something was wrong. Something was really wrong. And I couldn't figure out what it was. I, I go to my advisors and my counselors and they said, no, nah, everything's fine. You're studying, you're praying, you're doing great. And I can tell, no, 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 something is wrong. And it was God massaging my, my stiff neck trying to open my eyes to see something important. And I was stuck on two scriptures. I was stuck when I came to Romans 8 and verse 7. So let's take a look at there for a second. Let's go over to Romans 8 and verse seven, 7. I'll throw up the screen again. And in Romans 8 and verse 7, I was mystified by what Paul says. In Romans 8, the Holy Spirit chapter, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the mind that has the Holy Spirit and the mind and the carnal mind that doesn't. The Christian mind and the non-Christian mind. And he says, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. I thought, why not? Human pride. Don't, don't tell me what I can't do. <laughs> why not? Why can't I be subject to the law of God? Why can't I say, you know, this all looks like a pretty good idea. I don't, I don't believe in God, but this is, this is a good idea. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to covet. I'm going to, you know, rest this day. I'm, you know, maybe there is a God. I'm not going to put anything before him. Why can't I choose to do that? In fact, didn't even Paul himself, didn't Paul himself say that he was righteous? You know, if we go to Philippians Oh, I think it's three and I think verse four. All right. So he says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anything else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And he talks about how hey, was a Hebrew of the Hebrews and there's a zeal, a zealous and all of that. And in verse six down here, he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. So wait a second now. So if Paul is blameless in the law, before he has the Holy Spirit, before he's a Christian, why is he saying that you can't be subject to the law in Romans 8, 7? Then I was stuck on another scripture. I went over to James 1 and verse 2. And James writes, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. I thought, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> I thought trials are what I'm, I'm crying out to God to be delivered from. Why am I supposed to be joyful when I encounter trials? Are you mad? You know, so what's going on here with these scriptures? What's, what's happening? So I was utterly, utterly perplexed about what was going on here. And as I struggled with that, began to come to mind what was going on. That I realized there were two different righteousnesses that Paul was talking about. If we go back to that, that scripture in Philippians 3, if I can get my computer to behave here, here we go. Let's go back to Philippians 3. And if we go there, 
right? So Paul said that he had you know, this righteousness that was in the law blameless. But he continues and says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And notice now verse 9, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Two different types of righteousnesses. Remember when we, we went to that scripture about reconciliation? What did it say? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's the righteousness of God that we must pursue. But what's the difference? That's what we need to understand. That's what I hope to bring to you today because if we don't understand the difference. Which one are we going to use? And I found the linchpin scripture. The linchpin scripture to me of almost the entire Bible was here again in the book of Philippians. Philippians is an amazing book. Most of um, the letters of Paul are written to problem churches. He's dealing with this and that. But Philippi was a strong community. So he was able to deal with very advanced topics of spirituality in the book of Philippians. And he tells them, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, or other translations will say, have this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. So here's the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Here's how Paul describes Jesus' way of thinking. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Not grasped like this. The Greek word is grasped like this, holding on to, not letting go. So even though he's in the form of God, he doesn't hold his Godship as something he's got to hold on to, grasp on to. But he empties himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. I had to ask myself, why did he do that? Why did he do that? I keep asking, what? why did God do that? And in effect, I'm asking myself, well, what is God getting out of this deal? What is God getting out of this? And there's the problem. The answer is nothing. If he wanted humans, he could have thrown us away and made a far less pesky lot, not ones who are going to nail him to a cross and, and deny him and run away from him and blaspheme him. Why did God do this? It wasn't to get anything for himself. He has everything. He's God. Talk about the man who's hard to buy for, right? He has everything. So what does he need? Nothing. So why did he do this? For one reason and for one reason only for love for love and this made it even more difficult that again as i thought about romans 8 7 why can't we be subject to the law well maybe paul isn't talking about the ten commandments maybe as you boil the law down you come down to the two great commandments right love god with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself and you boil it down even more you get the romans 13 10 right that love is the fulfillment of the law so i thought wait a second that just makes things worse is Paul saying that only Christians can love? Hmm. I mean, don't Muslims love? And don't atheists love their wives? Don't you know Hindus love their children? What do you mean they can't love? That doesn't make any sense. And so as I thought about that. I realized again, just like two different righteousnesses, there are two different loves. There is a godly love and there's a human love. There's a selfless love and a selfish love. There's a love which is internal. God is love and one that's externally reinforced. We love because. And there is an eternally sustainable love and there is an unsustainable love. That concept of reinforcement is really, really important. What is the difference when our love 
is rooted in what comes back to us, we have a problem. So let's look at reinforcement and see if, if we can explain this. I have an interesting quote here that I'll share with you from a counseling text. Uh, this is from Gerard Egan's The Skilled Helper. And he writes, in a sense, reinforcement is the central principle of behavior. Beings that are not God by their very nature act to, in order to gain something when they act. There is no such thing as absolutely selfless behavior. People who are selfless find some kind of deep satisfaction in altruistic behavior, even when altruism means suffering some kind of loss. So, hmm, that's kind of interesting. So there's a difference between our human good and our human love and God's love and God's good. And maybe the best way I can explain it is this way. Picture, picture a romantic dinner with your beloved, right? You're there and it's absolutely perfect. The food is wonderful and, and the wine is sparkling with the stars above and the moon is in her eyes. The music is playing in the background and you look deeply into her eyes and you say, darling, I love you. And she looks back at you and she says, why? <laughs> and we would say, well, because of all the things you are, because you're so kind and wonderful, you're so wise, you're such a wonderful mother to our children, you're such a, a beautiful person, you, you just make me feel complete when I'm with you and I'd be so lost without you. We think about that and is, is that good? Yeah. And is that love? Yeah. And is that entirely selfish? Yeah. <laughs> You see the basis of that love. I love you because of what I receive from you. Now, if we were to sit at that same romantic dinner with our Lord Jesus, and he would look deeply into our eyes and say, I love you. And we in a fit of madness were to say, why? He wouldn't say because of all the things you are, filthy sinner, filthy rags, one who crucifies me. He would say, because of all the things I am, because I am love. Can you see the difference? I think God is very practical. What are we being prepared for? We're being prepared for an eternal life in heaven. So therefore, our lifestyle must be eternally sustainable. If our love depends on what we get back from the other person, that love is not sustainable. When the reinforcement dies, the love dies, the marriage dies, the relationship breaks down. That kind of love isn't good enough for heaven. That kind of love is not good enough for eternity. We need a love that can last forever because it doesn't depend on what we receive back. And this comes to the basis of what we truly repent of. We must repent not only of our overt evil, of our gossips and our lying and our stealing and our, our infidelities, but also of most of our love and most of our good. Think about your own actions, your own experiences, because our good and our love that's rooted in self isn't good enough. It's not the love of the Trinity. It's not God's love. You know, Hebrews, I'm gonna go there for the sake of time, but Hebrew tells us to repent, not just of evil works, but of dead works, like loving selfishly, doing good selfishly. Oh, I volunteer over the food, uh, food bank, but you know, I, I, I just get so much more out of it than I give. Why are we serving? Does this change our examination of conscience and our repentance a little bit, our confession, what we bring into the confessional? Have you thought about the ways in which we love selfishly? And have you thought about what the world would be like if everyone lived a truly selfless life? And I realized I was utterly trapped. I finally got it. I said, all right, God, I got it. I went to my prayer closet and I knelt down. And I said, God, I get it. I get it. I want to be perfectly selfless love like you for entirely selfish reasons. <laughs> and I couldn't help it. It's our very nature. It's the way we are from the time we're born. We can only understand the world from behind our own two eyes. It's the way we see everything in relation to ourselves. Yes, I want to be selfless like God for selfish reasons, to get to heaven, to escape hell, to be happy in life, to be fulfilled, to be whatever it might be. But everything was about me. 
I was standing on one side of the Red Sea, and I knew I needed to be on the other side of the Red Sea, and I can't swim that far. I needed a miracle, a miracle greater than the parting of the Red Sea. And then it struck me. That's what Christianity is. Christianity isn't a religion. It's not about doctrine and dogma and prophecy and history and health food or whatever else you hear from the pulpit. Christianity is the miracle of the literal transformation of our very nature from our inherently selfish human nature to the entirely selfless nature of God. Because only the love of God is eternally sustainable. Our human love is not and therefore unfit for heaven. Everything we do in life boils down to this. You know, there are really only two ends in life. The opposite of love is not hate. That's a symptom of the opposite of love. The opposite of love is self. When we think of everything we do in life, there are only two ends. Everything we do, we either do for self or for love. And most of the good we do is for self. Most of our love is for self and we need to repent of that and take on god's love we've got to see the difference and how do we see the difference we see the difference in the cross just like we learned from philippians I have a whole raft of scriptures up here that we're kind of running out of time to cover i'll see how quickly i come along i don't want to steal time from father davis but um how do we know the difference well, again, we, we turn to the scriptures and we see it. Let's take a look again to John. First John is another one of those books like Philippians, where it's just deeply profound, where, we can, where John covers very mature themes of Christianity. And let's see what he says about this. So he writes to us and says, we know love by this. Right? How do we know the difference between human love and godly love? We know love by this that he laid down his life for us right? when there was nothing to get back he laid down his life for us and what are we supposed to do we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren we have to do the same this is the great call of christianity it's not being a good person the way you think to be a good person it's not homespun wisdom it's not anything we might think of of ourselves it's not making our old selves better it's changing ourselves completely what are we called to do nothing less than being perfect Right. How does Jesus describe this to us? Right? He says, I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So you may be sons of your father. Sons look like their father. They behave like their father. How are we going to be sons like a father? How do we look like our father? For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you back, if your love is based upon what you get back, what reward is that? Tax collectors do that. You greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's what salvation is about. Developing that kind of love, that change of our nature. We must be holy as God is holy. We must love as God loves. Why? Think about it. God's so very practical. If our love is based upon our needs and what we get back, what are we going to do when we have everything? Right? We read in Hebrews 2, all things will be placed under our feet. We'll have all things. When we have everything and need nothing, if our love is selfish, will we love anymore? Not really. How often do lives and families grow cold when they have everything? We must change to be fit for eternity. We must change to love like god to have his love that's what we're called to do if we're this righteousness that's just our own goodness i mean the pharisees would have been the most righteous people on earth but remember matthew 5 and verse 20 i wish i had time to go through the sermon on the mount on this it's just fascinating looking at the sermon on the mount in this perspective but he said unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the pharisees how could that be i mean they were just nitpickers on everything and then he goes on to describe the problem and he says, look, it's not just enough that you don't kill. The problem is you still have hate. It's not just enough that you don't commit adultery. You still have lust. And he wasn't making the law greater by saying, okay, now instead of don't commit adultery, I'm telling you don't lust. He's illustrating the problem with the type of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees because it only deals with what we do and not with what we are. Christianity must change not just what we do, 
It must change the very nature of what we are. That's what we need. That's what the, that's what the new covenant is. All right, let's hop over to that. Let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah 31, the, uh, the new covenant. And the new covenant isn't like the old covenant. The old covenant was kind of like horse trading. Right? You do this for me, I'll do that for you. You obey me, I'll make sure your crops don't fail. You obey me, I'll make sure your flocks are healthy. You obey me, I'll keep you from being invaded. It's horse trading. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. The new covenant is not like that. In fact, he says that, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I'll make a new covenant, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them from the land of Egypt, which they broke anyway. This is the covenant I'll make in those days. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people and I'll remember their sins no more. You notice there's not, there's no horse trading here. God isn't saying you do this to me and I'll do that for you. Why did he do that in the Old Testament? Because they could only relate to God as humans, only relate to God selfishly. That's why it was a horse trading contract. In the new covenant, we have something different. We can now begin to think and feel and act as God does. By the miraculous transformation of grace, we can relate to God in a different way. Putting his, his law within us, changing our hearts. Changing the very way that we are. And it transforms everything. It transforms all of our relationships. Most of our relationships, we have this expectation. It's what do people do for me? Even our love is like that. Now, everything is about what do we do for others? To live eternally, we must live like God. Nothing short of that. That's what we're called to. That's what salvation is. That's how we arrive at friendship with God. Only when we come to love and live as God is, to think and to feel and to act as he is. Theological terms, what is this? That being trapped in that selfishness of being only to think in these selfish terms most of the time. Sometimes we have glimpses of true original justice. But that's what we call the stain of original sin. It's not what we did. It's what we are. And this transformation into being able to think and to feel and act like God instead to change our nature is sanctifying grace. We are called to partake of the divinity of God. I have it in your notes. I won't take time to read it for time. But literally, in our liturgy, in the public liturgy of the church, every December 30th, every priest, every nun, every monk, every friar reads this from Hippolytus about how we shall become divine. We will be deified, not because we're great, but because God is great and wants us to become like him. This is what a savior is. What's a savior? We throw the word around. A savior is someone who saves you from something so powerful you have no chance of overcoming it. This is what we see in, in the scriptures and how they're used. That's what a savior is. Okay, what's the word Hosanna mean? Hosanna means saved, we pray. That doesn't mean anything. Hosanna is a word like wow. You know, wow, what does it mean? We know what it means, but you can't define it. When you were saved from a foe who could vanquish you against you had no hope and they saved you, the cry was, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That's what we proclaim, that God has saved us from something we had no hope against. And that was our very nature. We can't change our nature, but God by grace does. Now we have a problem. This transformation, God's good, God's love is not humanly possible. I mean, even in the Old Testament, he tells me, he says in Deuteronomy 5 and 29 and 29, 4, oh, that they had a heart in them that they would obey my laws. I didn't give you a heart like that. That's the heart that we need. That's why we must be literally born again. We become a new creation. St. Peter in, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, he talks about being begotten with a new seed, right? Think of it, human reproduction. You take an egg and you take a sperm. When that sperm impregnates that egg, it completely changes it. It makes it capable of things it was not capable before of growing into a human. What happens when you take a human and the Holy Spirit comes to him in baptism? It's like we become fertilized. Instead of dying and just passing out of the body as nothing, we become transformed, something we could not be before. We become partakers of the divine nature. This is what true overcoming is. Uh, we don't overcome sin by resisting sin. Now, if you're tempted to sin, yeah, please go ahead and resist. But what's the real overcoming of sin? Think of it. 
God cannot be tempted with sin, James tells us. Why not? Now, think about this. If someone puts in front of me a, a dish of chocolate ice cream, I might be tempted to eat it, right? If someone else puts in front of me a, a cup of hot tar, I'm probably not very tempted to eat that. Being selfish, putting myself before others is about as attractive to God as drinking hot tar. How do we truly overcome sin? We completely change our nature so that being selfish, loving selfishly, taking from others, sinning overtly is about as attractive to us as hot tar. When we're like that, then Satan has no foothold. He has no place to grab us and bring us in. That whole section in James 1, verse 13 through 15, it's in your notes, is fascinating on how sin works. So true overcoming is when we no longer even have that desire to sin. In effect, what we do is we displace sin with God's selfless love. If all we're trying to do is be on guard against sin, to keep from sinning, we're fighting a defensive war. Right? We learned the hard way. You can't win a defensive war. You can't overcome sin by just resisting sin. We overcome sin by vanquishing sin. We overcome sin by displacing sin with love in our lives. When we are so full of humility and love guided by wisdom, when we're so full of Jesus by grace in our lives, that there's no room left for sin. That's how you overcome sin. That's how you defeat sin rather than just resist it. You displace it. It's like getting the air out of a glass. You fill it with water. How do you get sin out of our lives? You fill it with love. And that love only comes by the Holy Spirit and by grace. That's how it happens. So let's think about this. Let's think about this very, very practically. Okay, so here's the theory. What's, what's the lab? How does this really work? Well, let's phrase it this way. Christianity is always taking the smallest piece of pie. Okay, Christianity is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie. If you're not willing to always take the smallest piece of pie in life, you're not willing to be a Christian. Okay. Well, maybe not always. Maybe, maybe your, your, your wife is on a diet, in which case you, know, you just have to suffer for it. You gotta take the big piece for her. But, uh, <laughs> but think about the things we do. Why do we brush our teeth? brush our teeth so that we don't have buffalo breath and we don't go embarrassing ourselves and we brush our teeth so that we make the world better for others. You know, I kind of be a little rude here, right? You're sitting on the toilet and the toilet paper is almost out and you think to yourself, oh, I hope I can make it without finishing it so I don't have to change this toilet paper roll. <laughs> Instead of thinking, oh, all right, let me be able to do this so someone else doesn't have to do it. Right? You pick up a bunch of bananas. And what do you typically look for? The best one? Instead of thinking, maybe I'll take the worst one so no one else has to eat that and I'll save the good ones for somebody else. Why do we choose what to wear? Typically, it's what we want to wear. I want to be comfortable or I want to look good. You know, do we say, how do I dress for others? How do I make the world more beautiful? Or maybe I need to put on something a little more grungy than I'd like to and be embarrassed because I might need to help out over at that woman's house I'm going to visit. How do we decide what to eat? I typically say, I want to eat what I want to eat. Have we ever thought, how do we eat for others? Talk about fasting and mortification. How do we spend our money? We usually think, how, how do we get the most for the least? Isn't that how we usually think? Do we think in terms rather of how do I use the money I've been given by God to enrich others? We get in the car and we drive. What's our goal? Get there as fast as we can, as long as it's safe. Maybe I sometimes even forget about the second part. Or do we think, no, when I step into a car, my purpose is to love the other people on the road. It's pervasive. It is everything. You know, so these are these are critical, critical points. Now, I don't see uh, Doug. I I don't see my Father Davis in. Let me check my email to see if he's in, or check my phone to see if anything has come. If you've uh, if you've not heard from him, I'll keep going to redeem the time a little bit, and there's a lot more that I can cover. I just want to make sure we're not accidentally cutting him out. Uh, Doug, have you heard anything from him? No, I've not. Okay. Let me, if you pardon me, let me just quickly open up my email, make sure we don't have a panic message from him saying, Where are you? I can't find you. Uh, let me just look at it very quickly here and see what we get. All right. Let's come all the way down here to the end. Oh, there he is. Oh, good. Oh, good. 
<laughs> we were, we were oh, needed to, to, to stop. So it looks like obviously I, I do and very glad to have you. So let's Thank just you, let's summarize what we covered right here, right? So oh, we Father. recognize we're being reconciled to God. That's what salvation is. To do uh, that. Oh, oh, sorry? Uh, just to let you know, we can see Father, but he is a shadow. Um, there's no light in front of it. Uh, all the lights behind it. Oh, that's true. Father, I don't know if you want well, to... If you no, close the blinds here. and get yeah, a light I'll on. I'll close the blinds then. Okay. Sure, that might help. All right, so this salvation is bridging the gap between humanity and divinity. That's what Jesus does. Because that's the only way we can be reconciled to God, right? The mosquito and the human. We become partakers of the divine nature so we can love God as God has loved God. We can have that friendship with him. And to do that, we need his love not our love. So we must repent of not only our overt evil, but of our selfless, our selfish love and good. And we love with God's selfless love. That's the miracle of Christianity. That's what grace does. And how does that actually happen? What are the practical details? How do we work with the process? That's what I'll cover later on after we hear from Father Davis and from Monsignor Chifo. But uh, very happy to have you know, Father Mike here. Let me uh, just tell you a little bit about Father Mike that um, he was ordained a priest on May 16th, 1987. He's been a parish priest, a, 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 the cure of, the, the, the carer of souls for all but five years. Had uh, taught at the former Bishop Kendrick High School and, and was the school minister of the former St. Maria Goretti High School uh, in, in, from 90 to 95 between those two. But currently he's the pastor of Assumption VM uh, Parish in Feasterville, Pennsylvania. And he serves as well on the board of directors for the Flame of Love movement in the United States. And he gave an interesting little description when we asked him for a bio. He said, he believes in the reality of evil, strongly rooted in a person's choice to reject or accept the relationship with God who has made us for himself and truly believes Blessed Mother Mary is a powerful mediatrix of graces. While evil exists and Satan is always working as the grand liar, God's mercy and the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary are the antidotes. So with that, let me introduce to you Father Mike Davis. Thank you, Father.